I praise you, Father. I thank you, Lord, with all of my heart. Lord, I'm praying that your Holy Spirit would speak profoundly to us this morning. Lord, that your will would be done in this room. Lord, that you would move upon the hearts of the listeners, upon my heart, as you would use my, my, my body to speak, Lord. And Lord, you use all of us to speak. You use all of us to teach, to lead, and to guide. Lord, may your church be filled with the Holy Spirit. And Lord, may you be glorified through all of this. We need your help, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We anticipate what you are about to do in this earth. For you created this earth. And Lord, what you say goes. And we trust the results to be in your hand. And we are at peace today. May your will be done forever and ever. And your name, Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. In John chapter 13, Jesus washes the disciples' feet. It says in verse 1, Now before the feast of the Passover when Jesus knew that his hour had come that he should depart from this world to the Father having loved his own who were in the world he loved them to the end that's agape love that we love to the end see a lot of us don't understand that type of love of God we may love our spouses for a certain season and then we say oh it's time for a divorce you know, it's time for a new wife, a new husband. But you see, the love that Jesus displays is to the very end. To the very end of what? To the very end of his life. To the very end of his life. And that is what is missing, that true agape love. Jesus, before he is going to the cross, in this chapter, he is displaying not what it means to be served, but to serve. Those who serve are, are the ones who are greater in the eyes of God. They come with a servant's heart. They come to serve. They come to, to not try to be, uh, make their point made or to, to be proven right, but they come to do the will of the Father. And in the course of that, it, there's one word, humility. Humility. To humble yourself. If you're going to have a successful marriage, you must humble yourself. If you're going to have a successful walk with Jesus Christ, you must humble yourself. If you're going to have a successful life, period, you must humble yourself. That is what we see missing in society today. It's clearly demonstrated in, in all of our government leaders. They all have a pride in them. Some people say, uh, President Trump, he's the most prideful man. You know, they're all prideful. Why are you looking at just one person? As a matter of fact, look at yourself. Is there any pride in you? Absolutely. And we must do something about that. We cannot do something about someone else's pride, but we can do something about our own. In Jesus, there was no pride, but a complete humility. He loved them to the very end. He came. He knew what he was here for. Christian, do you know why you're here? Do you know why you exist? Listen, it's not that so that you can see who's going to win the Super Bowl in January or, you know, how much money you can make in a lifetime. But it's knowing the creator of heaven and earth and walking in his light, walking in his favor walking in his love, walking in his ways. Verse 2 says this, And supper being ended, the devil, having already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, the hands of the Lord, that is, and that he had come from God and he was going to God, he rose from the supper and laid aside his garments, took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and he began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Then he came to Peter and Peter said to him, Lord, 
Are you washing my feet? Now, this was the custom of the day. You know, they didn't have Nikes or, uh, you know, all these Adidas or all these nice shoes that we have today. Some of us have a closet full of shoes. Amen? (laughs) They did not have shoes. They had sandals. And so their feet were very, very dirty. All that crusty feet walking in that hot desert. And so a job of the servant for the master was to wash their master's feet. That was the lowest job you could do, and I think it still could be that today. You know, how many people even wash their feet when they're in the shower? Some people wash their feet when they're shower. Some people don't. Oh, that's too far down. (laughs) I can't reach that far. I got a little bit of an obstacle in the way. I can't reach that far down. So, you know, your feet go neglected. (laughs) Even in modern times, your feet go neglected. Feet are probably the, the, take the worst pounding of the whole body. You're on them all day, supposed to be at least, you know, walking on them. They take, they they don't get to breathe like your other parts of your body. They take the worst part uh, of, of daily life. And Jesus took the worst part and he washed it. He'll take the worst sinner and he'll wash it. He'll make all things new. But you see, the devil was there. The devil had already put something in the heart of Judas. Now, the devil cannot hear your thoughts, but he can certainly introduce things into you. Only God can hear your thoughts. No man, no devil, no no one can hear your thoughts. But thoughts can certainly be introduced to you. You ever have go like, huh, that's a good idea, Right? A thought was just introduced to you by somebody. You heard something. And that is exactly what happened to Judas. He had been following Jesus for three and a half years. And he was tired of Jesus' way. He wanted the Romans to be defeated right there and then. And he knew Jesus was not going to do it. At the same time, Judas was a thief. Judas had been stealing from Jesus for many years by now. And he was like, you know what? I'm not going to get anything out of this, Jesus, for my own personal gain. It's time to sell him out. Sadly, that's what a lot of people in church have even done. They've, they've sold Jesus out. So before we judge Judas, make sure, are you not selling Jesus? Are you not in this for a personal gain? Jesus got up. He girded himself. He washed their feet. And again... As always, one of the, the big mouths of the group opens his mouth. Verse 7, Jesus answered and said to him, What I am doing to you, Peter, you do not understand now, but you will know after this. You know, we, we don't always understand what Jesus is doing in our life, do we? But we eventually learn. And, oh, that's why that happened last year. Oh, that's, you know, you keep reacting to a situation the same way over and over and over. It could be a negative way, and you get the same results, and you should learn from that. Eventually, Peter would learn. Verse 8, Peter says to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus just told him, You're going to learn, Peter. In a while, you're going to learn why I'm doing this. But Peter is defiant. You will never wash my feet. Because he did not hear what Jesus just told him. And that is how we are today. We don't hear what Jesus always tells us. You're praying, you're praying, you're praying, and you come out of there, I didn't hear nothing from God. Really? You just were not listening. Because God is a faithful father. God speaks to his children all the time. But are we listening? And Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, in verse 8, you have no part with me. If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. He's not just talking about washing his feet right there and then. He's, Jesus is trying to demonstrate what it is going to take to be a servant, what it is going to take to follow him. And Jesus is not uh, really concerned about washing Peter's dirty feet. He's wanting to show Peter what it means to be a servant of God. And being a servant of God, you will have to physically meet the needs of people, not just their spiritual need, but their physical need as well. 
Verse 9, Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. See, P Peter's like, oh, well then, you know, sometimes we go to the extreme with God, right? We get a sudden word from the Lord. And then we go to the extreme. And then everybody's got to be on board with us. And if you're not on board with us, then you're quenching the Holy Spirit of God. I guess, you know what I'm talking about. And Jesus said to him in verse 10, He who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean, and you are clean, but not all of you. For he knew who would betray him. Therefore he said, You are not all clean. Jesus says, Peter, you're, you're still stuck on physical things, but I'm talking about a spiritual thing right here, Peter. That is what he's really saying. Verse 12, So when he had washed their feet, taken his garments, and sat back down again, he said to them, do you know what I have done to you? You know, when you go through troubles in your life, do you know what, what, what Jesus can ask that same question. Do you know what I've just, just done to you? Lord, I just lost my job. Jesus is saying, do you know why I just allowed this to happen? Lord, I just had a bad diagnosis from the doctor. Jesus is saying, do you know why I just allowed this to happen? Now, now he didn't cause it to happen, but he allows things to happen. Jesus, I just feel so angry and depressed right now. And Jesus is saying, do you know why I have allowed this to happen? Or sometimes Jesus does say, do you know why I have done this to you? Whether it's a good day or a bad day, Jesus is right there with you. And you're not alone. The devil was even right there. And Jesus is speaking to this group. In verse four, uh, 13, he says, you call me teacher and Lord, and you say, well, for so I am. Verse 14. But if I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash another's feet. Hmm. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. You know, washing feet is not just the only example Jesus gave us. Jesus gave us a whole bookload of examples. That's why we were here all night Friday praying. Because that was just one of many examples of Jesus. And that is why I say, if you are truly a follower of Christ, not just spiritually, but even physically, you want to walk in the ways of Christ. Many people are... Are, do not see a purpose in praying all night. Many people are intimidated by praying all night. Not just praying, but even having church fellowship from 11 at night to 6 in the morning. And we're not boasting in this church why we do this. We do this because this is what Jesus would do periodically in his life as well. And if we call ourselves disciples, if we call ourselves Christians, then we ought to do what Jesus did. And that is why I just encourage people when we do these prayer services, we need to follow because Jesus has given us examples. We're praying, we're serving, we're loving, we're, we're following him. But we're also, there, there's something else that's missing. We're, we're, we're supposed to be called an eyewitness. We're supposed to testify. We're supposed to give, give testimony of what Jesus has done in our life. Do we do that as well? Jesus gave many examples. He says in verse 16, oh, yeah, let, me, let me read it again, verse 15. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. Look at that. If Jesus had to pray all night, if Jesus had to serve, then we're not greater than him. So why do we are not willing to do the things he did? You know, challenge yourself. Friday night at your home by yourself. Pray all night. Spend time with the Lord. Turn the TV off. Turn the cell phones off. You, you know why I, I talk about the topic of prayer a lot? Because if we don't have a prayer life, then we have nothing. Nothing. Much prayer, much power. Little prayer, 
little power. The power of prayer is very underestimated in the church today. But yet Christ did that every day. He stayed communicated with his Father. And that is how we stay communicated. And now as we see the world raging and raging against God, we are called to really up our faith. To really to stand up with an even bolder faith. Not, not in the faith that you had when you first got saved. Because we're supposed to grow in our faith. Some of us have decreased in faith. And some of us think that our faith at conversion is, is good enough. Well, you know, it, it may be good enough for you to get into heaven. Amen. But it can also backfire and cause you to backslide. If you don't grow. Who ever heard of a child who is five years old and refuses to walk? What would you think as a parent? You are seven years old and you still want to be in a baby stroller? What would you think? I have a kid. There's something seriously wrong with this kid. Am I right? We are to grow as the people of God in our faith. We, we are to not just grow in knowledge, but more importantly, we are to grow in the Holy Spirit. Show evidence that the Spirit of God has baptized us and that the fruit of the Holy Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control are evident. Do you have self-control? What, what, what do you mean self-control? Self-control, if you have a problem with, with cursing and lashing out, if you have a problem with going from job to job to job, and you know that's not God's will, if you have a problem with laziness, whatever it may be, but, but as a Christian, you have self-control to put yourself uh, 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 away from those habitual lifestyle of sin. That's what self-control means. People say, well, God helps those who help themselves. That is not even found in Scripture. That's not. I, I used to say that all the time growing up. I heard that, but that's not true. Mom, you may have even said that to me. I don't know. Because I was always a lazy kid. <laughs> right? But there is a certain responsibility on our part. And Jesus is saying this. Look in verse 17. He says, if you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. If you know what it means to be a servant, you're blessed. If you know what it means to walk in the examples of Jesus, you're blessed. Amen? You help meet the needs of people, not just spiritually first, but also secondly, physical needs. Well, you know, Jesus would meet their physical need first. You know that, right? He would gather them all together and he would feed them. And then he would heal and teach and all those other things. He met both of their needs. And today in, um, in America, we have Social Security. We have Medicare for those who cannot get that help. You know, back then, it used to be the church that would meet those needs of the people. But when the Depression hit, and FDR came around with his social agenda, a democratic socialism. It birthed Social Security. It birthed all these things, what we see now. And now there are a lot of elderly people on these government programs when it was supposed to be the church's responsibility to care for people. See how we as a church have gone so far away from the example that Jesus left us? We've gone so far away. Imagine the lives that would be changed if today the church would come to the elderly, to those that are disabled, and say, we're going to help you. We're going to help you. We know that you can't pay your bills. We know that you have problems with, with health. We're going to pray over you. We're going to help you. And look, what do you think it would do, not only to those people who would be helped by the church, but even to their families to see the church loving people? See, but the government robbed the church of that. And now the church is like, it's norm. Oh, there's Medicare. There's Medicaid. Yeah, but Michael, there's 300 million people in this nation. Really? Is that just a number too big for God? We cry out for revival, but yet we're not willing to pray. We're not willing to gather, but just every once in a while on a Sunday. Wake up, America. Wake up, church. 
wake up because the birth pains have been growing and growing and growing and I am no prophet but I hear what the Lord the spirit of the Lord is saying and judgment is coming wrath is coming and as a matter of fact it is here already it is coming but to those who are in Christ they will live and not die Jesus says we must serve and we're blessed if we serve. Verse 18, Jesus goes on to say, I do not speak concerning all of you. I know whom I have chosen, but that the scripture may be fulfilled. He who eats bread with me has lifted up his heel against me. Wow. Speaking of Judas. Now I tell you before it comes that when it does come to pass, you may believe that I am he, the Messiah, that is. Most, verse 20, most assuredly I say to you, he who receives whomever I send receives me. And he who receives me receives him, God, who sent me. That is why we give to the churches today, because it is the form of the church that Christ has instituted where ministries are birthed. And the church is supposed to send out missionaries and evangelists. You know, you remember in the book of Acts when Paul and Barnabas, they were missionaries. But what did the church do? The elders came together, they laid hands on them, they prayed over them, they fasted, and they sent them out. And guess what? Churches were birthed. And how did it begin? It began by the institution that Jesus set up, the church, to pray over these men to send them out. And it's still supposed to be the example of the church today to send out laborers, to send out workers. But the church is so upside down today, they don't have the mind of a servant to raise up disciples, to train them, to teach them, and to send them out. They want to keep them there so that they can have a big church and say, oh, look at how good our songs are. We have thousands of people in here, and we're just, we're an awesome church. But have they birthed anything? Has souls truly been saved? Are we seeing a, 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 a revolving door of from church to church to church to church, and no new converts when is the last time we led somebody to the cross of jesus when is the last time we've we, we've we've um, multiplied our spiritual faith into someone else we keep it to us and we say well you know what pretty much is all sealed and done lord who's ever going to hell is going to go to hell reprobate minds are here and we're just we're just going to hang on to the rapture What a pitiful way to think. What a pitiful way to think. We're called to, to be the salt and light of this earth. And Jesus is saying to them, you know, there, there's a devil here, and I know who he is, but I'm not talking to all of you. I'm talking to you. You know who I'm talking to. And you know what? Those in the church today, they hear what the Lord is saying. And there are people in the church, it, right now it's going in one ear and it's going in out the other because they don't belong to God. Michael, we're all children of God. No, we're not. Why do you think we must be reborn again into the family of God? Because we are dead to God before when we have our sin. The book of Hebrews 6 talks about that. You know, how, how could we receive the goodness of the Lord to taste His mercy and then to just go back into sin? The Bible says it's better if they were never even born again. The, there must be a fear of God in our hearts because the fear of God draws us to God. It draws us into His holiness. It draws us into His righteousness. That is Jesus. Verse 21. When Jesus had said these things, He was troubled in spirit and testified and said, most assuredly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. See, he already knew what was going to happen before he even picked Judas to follow him. But he has to follow the formality of things. Jesus always follows the formality. He allows you to live your life. He knows what you're going to do in the end of your life anyways. But he, this is the thing about God. He knows all things, but yet he plays out all things. It's his business alone, not ours. 
And that's why I said he knows your heart. Even when you were wicked, he still knew your heart, Christian. He still knew your heart and he loved you to the fullest. Even when you didn't know him, when you lived deep in sin, he loved you to the fullest even then. You know, as I was as a sinner and so as I am as a, as a preacher today, God has always loved me to the fullest my whole life, even when I didn't know him. I can never do anything that can make God to love me more. He loved you to the fullest. He gave every one of us an opportunity to know him, to draw near to him. We are without excuse. So quit feeling sorry for yourself. Get up and serve the Lord. Because that is where life is found. That is where the blessing is found. When you repent of your sins and you turn to Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins and you follow him all the days of your life, he is your Lord, he is your Savior, and he will baptize you in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You might speak in new tongues. You might speak in, you might have a different gift of the Spirit, but you know what? You're going to have the love of Jesus in you. That is the number one evidence that the love of Jesus is in you and you have a servant's heart. You know, I had someone yesterday tell me, I'm not going to uh, come, I'm, I'm going to pick on you. They texted me, said, I'm not going to come to church tomorrow. I have a, I got something important happening. I have an opportunity to go fishing and uh, talk to some guys about Jesus. And I just said, okay, you know, no problem. And then they text me right back, never mind. Never mind. They, they said, never mind. And basically, I know where I'm supposed to be right now. You know, I, I love when people hear God. I love when people hear God. You know where you're supposed to be. There's always a good time to go fishing, amen? I mean, there's always a time to go fishing. I mean, the weather's perfect. We're going a little bit. But when you serve the Lord, you're, you, you think you know a thing to do, but then all of a sudden God says, but I have this for you. And he abruptly changes your plans. And that's a good thing. That person experienced the leading of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Verse 22. Then the disciples looked at one another, perplexed about whom he spoke. They're like, well, one of us is going to betray? Think of it, 12 guys looking at each other. One of you is a sucker. One of you is, is a joke. One of you. But, you know, I would have thought, I mean, because I like to read in between the lines of the Bible, okay? And sometimes that's good, sometimes it's not. But I, I, when I read that the first time, I was like, well, you know, if I hung out with a guy for three and a half years, day and night, all the time... And that Jesus said that, I would have probably had a good guess who that would have been. <laughs> right? And the other ones are probably saying the same thing. It's probably this one, this one, you know? But they all looked at each other. Why is that they were perplexed? Were they all had a guilty conscience? Were they all being unfaithful to God in their own way, but only Judas's way was being exposed? I mean, think about it, right? In a group of guys or gals, y'all know each other, especially after three and a half years. But yet they were all perplexed. Why? Because I think, and I'm just thinking, and my mama says and my wife says, sometimes that's my problem, I think. I think they all were guilty of something that was not honoring to God. But yet Jesus loved them and was still wanting to teach them. Woo. Now, verse 23 says this. Now, when there was leaning, now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom, one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. Jesus loves one more than the other? No. It's just that the guys in the group knew that, you know, maybe this kid was a little more faithful. I don't know. I don't know. But Jesus loved them all. I know that. Jesus has no favorites. I know that. Um, amen. My mama says that she has no favorites, but I know I'm her favorite. Okay? I know that. Amen? Simon Peter therefore motioned to him and to ask who it was of whom he spoke. And that's Peter. P 
Peter's always opening his mouth. Then leaning back on Jesus' chest, breast, he said to him, Lord, who is it? (laughs) Who is it, Lord? I I could imagine Jesus going like this. It's you. You know, (laughs) you know, I I mean, I, I, the boldness to ask Jesus that, right? I mean, that's Peter. I mean, you're bold, Peter. You don't realize that deep in you, Peter, you're a coward. You're a, you're a fake, Peter. Your, your faith is not really what you think it is, Peter. And you're about to be exposed, Peter. You're busy about what other people, you're not even looking at yourself, Peter. Who is it, Jesus? It's you. No, he didn't say that. What did he say? It's what he should have said. That's what he should have said. It's Judas, but you're going to betray me too. That's exactly what he was fixing to say, though. Why? Because Peter opened his mouth. Was it ordained for Thomas or Andrew or even John to be the one to betray Jesus? Was it? Was it? But because Peter opened his mouth... Maybe it was ordained for Peter to be the one to be exposed, to be a one that, that denied Christ three times. See, be careful when you open your mouth when you shouldn't open your mouth. The Bible says that the best thing a wise man can do is say nothing. Amen. Oh, wow. She's guilty of that one. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Amen. I'll join you in that group, sister. I'll join you in that group. But it's true. The best thing a wise person can do is say nothing. The Bible also says that when words are many, sin is present. Man, we got a lot to learn. And so as we read on, Jesus answered, verse 26, Jesus answered, It is he to whom I shall give a piece of bread when I have dipped it. And having dipped the bread... He gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. Now the piece of bread, now after the piece of bread, Satan entered him. Then Jesus said to him, what you do, do quickly. Here is Jesus feeding you. You know, in that night, right there in that night, the Lord showed them communion but before he he did that communion with him i believe he had showed judas this specifically and and judas betrayed it judas took it he ate it and it meant nothing to him it meant nothing to him that god would provide for an atonement of sin it meant nothing to judas and that's why jesus said that was the final straw you've taken from me time and time and time and time again judas you've stolen from not just me and my ministry judas but from the world you've stolen from god and now god is about to take from you god is about to judge you And many people have taken, taken, taken from Jesus. And they don't give. That's why the Bible, there's such a deep teaching about giving of your treasure, your time, and your talent. That you're called to be a good steward. You give freely. And that's why I believe, I'm old school, I'm sorry, but I believe in the principle of tithing. I do. I believe because that was what Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob did before the law of Moses was ever given. Michael, do you tithe? That's not your business. Because what you do is none of my business either. But the Lord knows. The Lord knows what you do. And that's all that matters. And Judas took the last thing from Jesus that bread which i believe symbolized his body judas ate it and satan entered into him there was no place found for jesus in judas but only for satan and satan entered in him and there may be someone in this room there may be someone online you have no place for jesus in your heart 
but only for Satan. Verse 28, but no one at the table knew for what reason he said to him. For some thought because Judas had the money box, he was the treasurer, that's what I said earlier, that Jesus had said to him, buy those things we need for the feast, or that he should give something to the poor. Jesus would tell them that time and time again, because Judas had the money box. And so they thought this was another one of those occurrences. Peter was, very, was clearly told, here's the betrayer, and yet Peter is so spiritually dumb, he doesn't even see that either. And he's, he's clearly told by Jesus. God has clearly told you some things. He's told me some things, and we're spiritually dumb. We just don't want to get it. Praise God when the light goes off in our head. Ah, there it is. Yes, Lord. Verse 30, having received a piece of bread... He then went out immediately, and it was night. Getting close to betraying Jesus later that night. So when he had gone out, this is incredible, because I want you to see something here. As we come, we're, verse 31, 38 is our last verse. Watch this, please. So when he had gone out, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him immediately. Meaning, this is going to come quick, guys. Guys, this is going to come very quickly. By this time tomorrow, guys, I'm dead. It's going to come fast. Little children, verse 33, little children, I shall be with you a little while longer and you will seek me. And as I said to the Jews, where I am going, you cannot come. So now I say to you, let me stop there. Verse 33, he's going to give them a new commandment. But this is what blows me away. He waited for Judas to leave before he said this. Once Judas left, it threw the wheels into motion of Jesus now going to the cross. The betrayer was coming. The men who would arrest him were now going to be sent to come and get him. This throws everything into, the, into motion. Verse 34, Jesus says, Now I say to you, verse 34, he says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. Wait a minute. But doesn't the Bible, the Old Testament, teach us to love, right? Love the Lord your God with all your mind, body, and soul, and love your neighbor, your brother as well? Why is Jesus calling this a new commandment if it was given in the Old Testament times? You want to know why? There's a difference. Think about this, guys. Look, Christian, a new commandment. This is not a new commandment, Jesus. This is something that we have learned from, from days of old. So what is Jesus, why is he saying a new commandment I give you? Because we as believers would now begin to move into a deeper realm of love, into a, a true realm of faith, being baptized into the Holy Spirit. Experiencing the salvation of Jesus Christ, the forgiveness of sin. By that happening, we would now have a new commandment to love like never before. Where our love as a Christian can draw people out of sin and into the salvation of Jesus Christ. We are, as a Christian, we can change the world with the love of God that is in us. It has kicked off something very new. That this is, this is what Jesus is referring to. And look what he says in verse 35. He says, by this, meaning when you love one another as I have loved you. He says in verse 35, by this, all, meaning the world, will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So when you love the Christian brotherhood worldwide, that is the mark of true Christianity. That is signifying that you are a true disciple of Christ. 
when you love the body of Christ. That's why there's so many church splits. That's why there's so many denominations. That's why there's so many, oh, I follow this pastor. Oh, I follow that pastor. Well, you should be following Jesus. Well, I'm a Baptist. Well, I'm a Pentecostal. Well, I'm a Methodist. Well, I'm a Presbyterian. Those things will not get you into heaven. None of those things were. And, all, and somewhere in all of their denominational creed, there's error in all of them. I'm not saying they're going to hell. That is not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is, guys, that love doesn't exist in that. You know what the Lord told me many years ago? He said, because I had a, a, an issue with, Lord, we don't pray with pastors and we don't pray with other churches in this town, Lord. What, Lord, you know, and, and the denominationalism, that's what separates us. And the Lord said, well, y'all put the walls up, y'all bring them down. Man's not willing to bring those walls down, though, because I've seen that. I've seen where, where, I've seen where certain preachers don't want to pray with other preachers because they're a different denomination. And if that burned my heart, how much more would it burn the heart of God? Children fighting like that in the family of God. And that's why there's no revival. Jesus says, the world will know my disciples by the love they have for one another. If you're not honoring that a new commandment, that great commandment, how can we how can we go into the revival of God? If we're not understanding this and applying this and teaching this, how can we? How can we? There's a question mark to that, guys. What will you do? What will you do? Verse 36. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Lord, who is it? Lord, where are you going? So many questions, right? Who had a child that asked so many questions? Drove them crazy. Mom, don't raise your hand. <laughs> Mom, what is that? That's the moon. Well, why is it so bright? Well, why is the sky blue? Because it's just blue. But why, Mom? I would ask these. I wanted to know why the sky was blue. I wanted details, and I would drive her crazy. I remember one time, I was about 10. My mom bought a big bottle of aspirin in the early beginning of summer. By the end of summer, that, those aspirins were gone. And I felt bad because I actually remember that I made my mom take all these aspirins. <laughs> uh, that's a true story. We asked so many questions. In verse 36, Peter, uh, Jesus answered him saying, where I am going, you cannot follow me now. Meaning he was going to the cross, guys. He was going to the cross. Peter could not go to the cross. Peter was going to deny him. None of the disciples could go to the cross with Jesus. Nobody could get on the cross and do what Jesus was going to do. That's what Jesus was talking about. He says, where I am going, you cannot follow me now, now, but you shall follow me afterward. Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you now? Should have been an exclamation mark there. I will lay down my life for your sake. And Jesus answered him, Will you lay down your life for my sake? Most assuredly, I say to you, the rooster shall not crow till you have denied me three times. Meaning, by the time it's morning, you will have denied me three times. Peter says, I will follow you. In another gospel, he says, I will follow you to death. I will go to prison for you. I will do anything. I, I will not be like these others, he said in another gospel, but I will follow you. Wow. When there's a lot of eyes in your sentences, <laughs> just get on your knees. In Isaiah 14, you know, as a matter of fact, let, let me take you there. Isaiah chapter 14. I want to read, I want to show you something before I close. Isaiah 14, and let me pull this up. Verse 12. Verse 12, verse 13, verse 14, verse 15. This is known as the passage of the fall of Lucifer. Isaiah 14, verse 12, 13, 14, 15. Look at the language. The Bible says, How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. 
How you are cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations. For you said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farther sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high five times. He says, I, 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 I. Verse 15. But yet you shall be brought down to Sheol, to the lowest depths of the pit. Go to verse 16, please. I'm sorry. Verse 17 also. The Bible goes on to say, those who see you will gaze at you and consider you saying, is this the man who made the earth tremble, who shook kingdoms, who made the world as a wilderness and destroyed its cities, who did not open the house of his prisoners? This is referring specifically to Satan, Lucifer. In this chapter of its context, guys, it, it, it's talking about the king of Babylon. But in this brief break in, cha in the chapter, it speaks specifically to Lucifer. And Lucifer says five times, I, 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 I. And it goes on to say that the nations will one day look at him and say, is this the man? Meaning, like, like the angels were called, were called the sons of God. And so it's not necessarily meaning man, like you and I, men, women. Is this the one? Is this the crea creation? The one who was created like a man? Is this the one who made the nations tremble? Is this the one who caused billions and billions of people to go to hell and reject God? Is, are you serious? One day we will look at Satan and say, this guy was a joke. Are you serious? Look at him. He's nothing. And yet, we have thousands of years of recorded history of what he did? Are you serious? He held that much power over humanity? Are you kidding me? It all begins with I. See, when you are stuck on yourself, you are in the spirit of Satan. And so, Jesus was teaching in John chapter 13, watch this, what it meant to get yourself out of I and to be for Christ, to have the heart of a servant, not to come be served. You do not serve God when it's convenient. You serve God in all seasons, when you have cancer, yes. when you're in, a, in, a, in a, a state where your mind feels like you want to be depressed, when you feel you just want to get angry and lash out. The Bible says that a vengeance is God's. You serve God in all seasons of your life. And it begins with humbling yourself and serving. And you find that you learn those principles in the fellowship of church. Because we all come together. We don't have the same opinions. We rub each other the wrong way sometimes. But yet we learn one thing in church fellowship. And you know what that is? humility you humble yourself you learn to respect others not compromising the word of god but you learn how to get along and you learn how to serve jesus faithfully and iron sharpens iron and this is what jesus was actually doing at the end of his ministry in 14 john 15 and 16 jesus begins to set the pillars and the institution of the church and it cannot be set until he tells them about what it means to truly serve these are the most powerful scripts uh, chapters in all of the bible john 13 14 15 and 16 because it speaks to us today how we function as a church love and if there's love then you know how to serve you know how to follow amen this is John chapter 13. Give God praise in his house. Amen.